I'm offended by chewing gum. I'm offended by backwards pointing baseball hats. <laughs> but I don't try to get a version of the blasphemy law passed to prevent people chewing gum or reversing their cap. So what if I'm offended? So what if my feelings are hurt? Does that give me the right to prevent others from expressing their opinions? However, is there a time when it is right to be offended? I think so, yes. We should be offended when children are denied a proper education. We should be offended when children are told they will spend eternity in hell. We should be offended when medical science, for example, stem cell research, is compromised by... <laughs> compromised, I should say, by the bigoted opinions of powerful and, above all, well-financed ignoramuses. Uh, a web question. It's from Cassandra Devine in Victoria. It's to Richard Dawkins. Why do you feel the need to express your views so stridently uh, when they're not always welcome? Isn't it rather like going around to playgrounds and telling children that Santa Claus isn't real? <laughs> in, in modern English vocabulary, it's more or less impossible to use the word atheist without preceding it with the adjective strident. They simply go together. I am not strident, I'm no more strident than anybody else. Um, now, is it like disillusioning children about Santa Claus? The weird thing is that children manage to grow out of Santa Claus and some <laughs> reason... Sir, I'm being allowed by the friend I used to work with to come back. I cannot afford to build my life on hallucination, but on Jesus Christ who is the rock. And it is that I have asked you to address, please. You are obviously sincere, uh, but obviously I do not share your beliefs, and I think you are hallucinating. That's all I can say. I don't doubt your sincerity. Okay. Every night on television we see satire, we see comedy, we see people poking fun at politicians, at all sorts of things. Why should religion, especially the Muslim religion, why should that be immune from people making fun of it? Not that this is making fun of it, I understand, yeah. but even so, why should you think that Islam should be uniquely immune from the things that politicians are not immune from and the rest of us are not immune from? Why are you so privileged in taking offense? You're talking about the people who are in the land just like you and me. Our Prophet and Allah, they are completely different. Our holy book is completely different. I think your thinking is very narrow. You're thinking politicians like Tony Blair, George Bush, you can joke about them and you can joke about Islam. I think you haven't got knowledge enough. You should go to have some more study and then come back on the, on the telephone to talk to me. Politicians really exist. This is probably going to be the most simplest one for you to answer, but what if you're wrong? Well, what if I'm wrong? I mean, anybody could be wrong. We could all be wrong about the flying spaghetti monster and the pink unicorn and the flying teapot. Um, you happen to have been brought up, I would presume, in the Christian faith. You know what it's like not to believe in a particular faith because you're not a Muslim, you're not a Hindu. Why aren't you a Hindu? Because you happen to have been brought up in America, not in India. If you'd been brought up in, Indo in India, you'd be a Hindu. If you were brought up in... in um, Denmark in the time of the Vikings, you'd be believing in Wotan and Thor. If you were brought up in, in classical Greece, you'd be believing in, in Zeus. If you were brought up in Central Africa, you'd be believing in the great Juju up the mountain. In, there's no particular reason to pick on the Judeo-Christian God in which by the sheerest accident you happen to have been brought up and, and ask me the question, what if I'm wrong? What if you're wrong about the great Juju at the bottom of the sea? I think is the question really and like a scientist Nobel Prize winning scientist like Peter Meadow would say that the question why why are we here can't be answered by science and I I don't understand how we can say with such confidence that it can well 
What I would say about the question why is why do you think you have any right to ask it? Uh, it's not a meaningful question except unless you um, specify the kind of answer you're, you're, you're expecting. As a biologist, it's very easy to answer the question, why do birds have wings, for example? I mean, we can do that in, Dar in Darwinian terms. If you say, however, um, why do mountains exist? There are some questions which simply don't deserve an answer. I mean, the question, um, why do mountains exist? You can give an answer in terms of the geological um, processes that give rise to, to, to mountains, but that's not what you want, is it? You want something about the purpose of mountains. What is the purpose of a mountain? It's a silly question. Doesn't deserve an answer. The mere fact that you can ask a question, the mere fact that you can frame a question in the English language doesn't mean that it's entitled to an answer. If I say to you, what is the, what is the color of jealousy? It's a perfectly grammatical English sentence, but it's not a question that deserves an answer. The correct answer is, don't ask such a silly question. But is it not part of the human condition to ask these it questions? It may well be part of the human condition to ask silly questions, yes. <laughs> God ordered Abraham to make a burnt offering of his longed-for son. Abraham built an altar, put firewood upon it, and trussed Isaac up on top of the wood. His murdering knife was already in his hand when an angel dramatically intervened with the news of a last-minute change of plan. God was only joking after all. <laughs> Tempting Abraham and testing his faith. A modern moralist cannot help but wonder how a child could ever recover from such psychological trauma. <laughs> By the standards of modern morality, this disgraceful story is an example simultaneously of child abuse bullying in two asymmetrical power relationships, and the first recorded use of the Nuremberg defense, I was only obeying orders. <laughs> God's monumental rage whenever his chosen people flirted with a rival god resembles nothing so much as sexual jealousy of the worst kind, and again it should strike a modern moralist as far from good role model material. The temptation to sexual infidelity is readily understandable, even to those who do not succumb, and it's a staple of fiction and drama from Shakespeare to bedroom farce. But the apparently irresistible temptation to whore with foreign gods is something we moderns find harder to empathize with. To my naive eyes, thou shalt have no other gods but me would seem an easy enough commandment to keep. A doddle, one might think, compared with thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife or her ass, <laughs> or her ox. Um, my question is for Professor Dawkins. Considering that uh, atheism cannot possibly have any sense of absolute morality, would it not then be an irrational leap of faith, which atheists themselves so harshly condemn, for an atheist to decide between right and wrong? <coughs> Absolute morality, the, the, the absolute morality that a religious person might profess would include what? Stoning people for adultery? <laughs> death for apostasy? Uh, punishment for breaking the Sabbath? These are all things which are religiously based absolute moralities. I don't think I want an absolute morality. I think I want a morality that, that is thought out, reasoned, argued, discussed, and... <laughs> based upon, I could almost say, intelligent design. <laughs> um, <laughs> the Quarterly Review of Biology is a journal in which biologists publish their findings, their research. I'm, I have edited an imaginary spoof issue of the Quarterly Review of Biology, devoted, as they sometimes are, to a particular topic, namely the topic, did an asteroid kill the dinosaurs? The first paper would be a perfectly respectable and normal scientific paper. Iridium layer at KT boundary and potassium argon dated crater in Yucatan indicate that an asteroid killed the dinosaurs. Nobody would be surprised to see a paper like that 
in any scientific journal. The president of the Royal Society has been vouchsafed a strong inner conviction that an asteroid killed the dinosaurs. It has been privately revealed <laughs> to Professor Huxdane that an asteroid killed the dinosaurs. Professor Haldley has been brought up to have total and unquestioning faith that an asteroid killed the dinosaurs. Professor Hawkins has promulgated an official dogma binding on all loyal Hawkinsians that an asteroid killed the dinosaurs. Professor Huxkins is personally offended by all strident, shrill and polemical denials that an asteroid killed the dinosaurs. Professor Hallux derives deep personal comfort <laughs> from his belief that an asteroid killed the dinosaurs. The president of the National Academy of Sciences has issued a fatwa Forty percent of Americans disagree with you and they can't reconcile their faith with the theory of evolution. The figure varies between 40, 45 percent and has done for about the last 30 years. It's an astonishing figure and it's, that appears to be true. Gallup polls seem to suggest that that is true. It's even worse than that because they actually believe that the world is less than 10,000 years old. And because since the true age of the Earth is 4.6 billion years old, that's a non-trivial error. I've previously compared it <laughs> I've previously compared it to believing that the width of North America is eight yards. <laughs> Steve Fielding, can one be a believer in God as well as a believer in the theory of evolution? Look, uh, I'm not an expert on these issues whatsoever, and I think people in Australia have uh, different uh, beliefs, and uh, their faith may drive them one way or the other. I actually believe in creationism. I think uh, the Prime Minister does as well. So, look, I suppose at the end of the day, each person will come to their own conclusion on the issue, Tony. You believe in creationism. So, of course, I've never heard you state this, but it's, it's a fact, is it? You believe in creationism, not evolution. Is that right? That's, that's correct. But, look, each person will come to their own conclusion well, and not, you know... <laughs> Richard, you'd like to respond. <laughs> do, do you believe the, the world is less than 10,000 years old? Look, uh, now, do you believe that? Look, <laughs> I, I think that there are a lot of questions in this area, and I think people will come to their own conclusion. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to force people into one way or the other. You're not being asked to force. You're not being asked to force. Creationist or an old Earth creationist. Yes. So, which so is it, you're a, you're, a, you're a young Earth creationist who believes the world is less than ten thousand years old. You're a, a, a parliamentarian in Australia who believes the world you live in is less than ten thousand. I, I didn't. I didn't say that, by the way. You're saying that I said it was ten thousand. All right. Uh, you've you've done debates all around the world. Have you ever had a, I guess a clever or uh, interesting argument from the other side? No. <laughs> and I worry that your, your methods and your, your, your how, how, how articulately barbed you can be ends up simply being ineffective yeah. when, when you have much more power of influence than what is currently reflected in your output. I gratefully accept the rebuke. Um, <laughs> um, I, just just one, one anecdote to show that I'm not the worst in this thing. Um, a, um, a former and highly successful editor of New Scientist magazine, who actually built up New Scientist to great new heights, was asked, what is your philosophy at New Scientist? And he said, our philosophy at New Scientist is this. Science is interesting, and if you don't agree, you can fuck off. <laughs> <laughs>